Hi friends, today I am thrilled to be sharing this conversation with Amy Fitzner all about singing games in elementary music. If you're already familiar with Amy, you'll know that she has so much knowledge about this topic and she brings so much experience to the world of children's singing games and just the culture of children's play in general. If you don't already have them, let me recommend her books, which you can find with a link in the show notes. And in the show notes, you can also find a link to Amy's bio so you can learn more about her and connect with her work. Amy and I started talking before the actual interview about her experience moving to her North Carolina campus, and she was sharing so much wisdom that I decided to just go ahead and keep it in our recording. So we are going to jump just straight into our conversation as Amy shares how she got introduced to the Schulwerk. You can watch our conversation on YouTube or listen on your podcast app. So here is Amy talking about some of her early ORF experiences. My name is Victoria Bowler, and this is episode 80 of Elemental Conversations. Yeah, so I was doing my, well, I was looking at starting my master's degree, and I knew I went to an ORF workshop and I was like, salivating over like, wow, this is me. Like I connect with this, like, oh my gosh, like this is who I am. Like I found my people. Um, and it was such a light bulb moment for me that I could just very simply make music with children in a very beautiful, playful way. I'm, I'm pretty serious, like one-on-one and with people I get in front of kids and I turn into a like, I, I don't, I'm some kind of idiot with children. I just go like to silly land and I love, you know, my facial expressions are like, you know, going crazy. And I'm like, who is this person? Like, this is not me. Um, I did do a lot of theater work, but you know, like that's, I am not that way. Like just one-on-one with people, but get me in front of children. And I just, you know, it's just so much more fun and seeing the fun that was possible with the ORF approach was what really led me down that path. And when I took my first ORF levels, I was just it was a wow moment of, okay, simplify, 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 Mm. refine, refine, refine. And that goes for my teaching language, as well as my process, as well as the activities and the scaffolding that needs to happen within a lesson. All of that, I needed to back my truck way up because I was, you know, I tend to fly through things rather quickly. And I, you know, learning that in my first ORF level, and then I went back for level two immediately. And then I waited a a year or two years rather to go back for level three. And then I did my master's level with Jos Vitak, who was one of ORF's, you know, students and, and contemporaries. So, um, yeah, it's been a beautiful journey and just, just learning how to simplify and go back to the basics and constantly have to remind myself to go back to the basics. I think we get so wrapped up, particularly when we go to a workshop and we see these grand things Mm -hmm. that people do, (laughs) or you go to a session at conference and they're working on one song for an hour and 15 minutes. And you're like, this just is not possible in my teaching situation. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. It doesn't need to be grandiose for it to be authentic and playful and childlike and musical. So true. You are talking about simplifying everything. Like what is the, what is the core thing that actually needs to happen in an elementary music situation? And even though we would love for students to read, you know, everything under the sun in every type of notation system that there is on the earth. And we would love for them to sing, um, you know, in every, every different style that there is. And we would love for them to play every instrument on earth. But when we get down to it, it is those very simple, like what are simple to us, simple musical interactions that are actually really profound. Like when we have kids like make eye contact with each other and like take hands in the physical world and like move around and, you know, someone does something and I react in a musical way and in a social way, like it really is um, a very, a very magical um, process, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, and it's, it's so fun to see them have these musical moments that probably happened at home yeah. 30, 40 years ago, maybe 50 years ago that are not happening at home now, mm-hmm. 
or are not even happening in a really authentic way because even in their classrooms, technology, <laughs> like don't get me on my soapbox about technology because it is, it is just, uh, it's great and it's wonderful. But, you know, you see, you've seen kids on college campuses that are walking for a breast and nobody's talking to each other because they're all texting each other. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of terrifying. I, you know, I, I, that's why I, one reason I love singing games and clapping games, because the children are forced to interact with each other in a very child friendly kind of way. And they're not on iPads and they're not on phones or tablets. And they're actually interacting and having to to work out some real world communication issues mm -hmm. or disagreements mm -hmm. and sort of problem solving in a very real kind of way that doing that on an iPad does not function yeah. in the same way at all. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So when we, when we say like we love technology and there's a role for technology and we want technology to be a part of the music experience because it already is a part of the music experience. At the same time, there is some really healthy friction that comes in the analog world of like navigating just the physical space together, navigating the emotional space together, navigating the musical space together. And that's one of the benefits of everybody being in the classroom at the same time in a, in like a physical world, not again, like n not to say that technology doesn't have a place because I think you and I would both agree, uh, you know, we're, we're having this conversation on zoom. People are going to listen to it as a podcast. Like we love technology and there is um, a real, there is a real need to teach kids and us our, ourselves how to handle the friction, how to handle some of the dissonance that can happen in particularly nowadays. Yeah, um, with with politically everything that's going on, you know. Um, but I think you know it's one of those things that being in community with each other, in that kind of very childlike way that's very engaging and amusing very often mm -hmm. with singing games it's often an amusing things mm -hmm. and the kids you know are often smiling and joyful and they're having this really rich musical experience that doesn't need to have an ipad <laughs> it doesn't need to have a smart board and they don't need to be using click and drag things they just are having this very authentic experience um, that is a really lovely thing. And it also engages those kids that don't necessarily want to sing or might be reluctant or the too cool for school kind of kids, the upper elementary kids, you know, it engages them in a very real way, because if they're not going to sing a solo to you just standing there, they might sing a solo in a singing game, might mm -hmm. not always. But they might that the you know, the the ante is a little higher, you know, because they're in this thing that's very engaging and it's usually very fast paced. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that sort of sequencing thing that happens within a singing game or a clapping game makes it a lot more approachable and easier for them to have that courage moment of, OK, I'll do it. They don't even think about it. They just do it. You know, there's no thought process. <laughs> Yeah, there's no time. There's no time because we're busy. We're busy playing. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to upper elementary. Yeah. I've also heard you talk about sequencing already. I definitely want to talk about that. Can we back up, Amy? And I would love to hear some of the, before we even get to the singing game, before we even like present it to our fourth graders or to our squirrely first graders, can you talk about your thought process for how you choose which singing games you're actually going to use? So maybe um, from a pedagogical lens or from a child development lens, like this grade versus this grade or this musical concept versus that. What's going through your brain when you just like open up the vast world of, of children's singing games? When I first start thinking about like what I'm going to do with the singing game, obviously the first thing that I approach it with is what concept are we focusing on at the moment? Where are we in that concept frame of what comes next? What has happened before that informs the teaching that's going to happen ahead? And an assessment piece, of course, because like if we're ready for quarter notes and eighth notes, we might do X, Y, Z song. But if we're not quite ready, we might do X, Y, Z song, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's not something I'm going to do just one time. Um, I was doing just a game song for the last four, three or four classes with my first graders, we've been doing Carnival of the Animals. And so I wanted something that was sort of thematically approached 
um, involved that concept of Carnival of the Animals. So I did this, this singing game and it also has a lot of, of quarter rest, which we're going to be, you know, going over a little bit more and into a little bit more depth with doing a lot more reading of quarter rest. And so we, we played the game one time and the kids loved it, had a great time. And then we played it again slightly differently because I always want to add some other layer of complexity into that game that we're playing, whether it's a nuanced kind of, you know, game, something that happens slightly differently in the game, or if it's something that we're going to add something to, we're going to add some instrument parts to, or we're going to add um, something that one of the kids has brought up, like, can we do it this way? Great, let's try it. What do we think about that? Oh, that didn't go so right. Great, what could we do differently? Or I might add an instrument part. Like today, we finally added a broken Bordeaux, first graders playing a broken Bordeaux. And um, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a broken apart, a perpetuated first and fifth scale degree. So we were in D minor. So we were playing D and A, just back and forth, D, A, D, A. And um, because we had sequenced it so much with them marching that beat and putting it in their body first, they went right to the instruments. And, you know, we did it on body percussion first. They went right to the instruments. And then half the class was at the instruments. Half the class was still playing the game. And then we switched out. But it was so seamless. But we couldn't have done that the first day, right? Because we needed to learn that song first and really have it integrated into their heads. And I'm a very strong believer that once I give a part to a child, so if I sing measures one through eight myself, then eventually what I'm going to do is have the child take over, you know, maybe the end of the song or maybe the beginning of a song or maybe certain words or a certain phrase in the song. And once I give them that part of the song, it's theirs. <laughs> yeah. This is this is the hard part for most of us, especially for us singers, is that we want to keep trying to like rip that control back and be like, no, and rescue them and save them. And that never is really successful because then they're constantly relying on us and they never become vocally independent, which is the goal, right? We don't want them to walk into a concert having sung with them. And then they get on the stage and they're like, wait, you're not singing? That's <laughs> like a good thing that they're not used to hearing that sound and it throws them completely off kilter. So, you know, that, that, that sort of, you know, getting them to the place where they can sing the song by themselves, once they're successful with that, then we're ready for the next step of changing something or changing something or tweaking something. Today was our final day doing that because that was the goal to play that broken Bordeaux. We're going to take that broken Bordeaux and put it on another singing game <laughs> next time. And um, then we're going to start adding some rests in there um, because that's, you know, that's challenging in, a, you know, if it's an 8B phrase and you're playing four measures of that and then you have to put a rest on that uh, final beat, you know, mm -hmm. dum, 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 and then back to the boom, boom, yes. boom. That's challenging, right? So, but now that we've introduced that quarter rest more, we're ready for that kind of activity a little bit more. So I hope I answered your question. I love it. That's fabulous. You're saying that it all comes down to what is the, uh, in addition to like, it's going to be authentic. It's going to be fun. It's going to be playful. It's going to be like a grand old time from a curricular lens. You're looking at what is the pedagogical goal. So if your goal is a beat without a sound, if we're going to talk about a quarter rest, you have 70 million ways that you can approach it, but you're threading all of those experiences together really intentionally and really um, sequentially even though to students, it just feels like play, like, oh, what's behind this door? Oh, what's behind this door? Oh, what's behind this door? You know? And that's one thing I really love about the ORF approach is that, you know, we we get, we have this, these things we talk about, this imitate, explore, uh -huh. create, label is somewhere in there usually before create, um, but we usually talk about it from the imitate, explore, create sort of perspective along with like Kodai has prepare, present, practice or mm -hmm. prepare, practice, present. I always forget the order. You're right. You're right. You got it. Was I right the first time? Yeah, present, but practice, I think yep. those two things, I think those two things actually really marry really well together because I, I often think, and I'm not a, I'm not a Kodai trained teacher, but I really love that whole model of prepare and get them ready for something. Because I think that's very similar to what we do with imitate. I agree. You know, and then sort of that getting ready to present that thing. Well, we have to explore it and use it before we're ready to label it. And then 
you know, we're going to do something and we're going to create with that idea. So it's not always a singing game that we do that with. A singing game might be used as an introductory activity. Mm -hmm. It might be used as an assessment activity. Mm -hmm. um, and there are days where I do just teach singing games just to have fun with the kids. You know, it's one of those things I, I heard many years ago, meet the kids where they're at. Yeah. So if the teacher drops them off at the door and they say, oh, you know, it was, it we didn't have recess today and they haven't had recess for 16 weeks and um it was breakfast for lunch but they didn't have any french toast so the kids just drank syrup and there were two birthday parties and they're you know like this kind of thing and my mind shifts immediately to let's go to a high energy singing game to give them that moment of fun explosive movement play because they probably have not been having a lot of that or if there's been like, you know, a crisis within the classroom, or if there was a really heavy moment that happened before they got there, it yep. really depends on how they show up when I use singing games. It might be something planned, but it also might be something I keep in my back pocket, like bump up tomato. Oh, yeah. um, that is my keep in my po back pocket game for when like it's a really bad day and we need some levity and some laughter and some joy. Then I will pull that song out and that game out because it's just so darn fun. And, you know, it's one of those things that's just such a classic fun, make somebody laugh. Like how often in life can you truly try to make somebody laugh, you know, especially in a music class. So I, you know, there are certain games that, that go in the back pocket that I'm like always thinking when they're showing up, how are they showing up and how can I meet them there and take them to where I want them to go by the end of the music class? Yeah, because you could say, we're just going to follow our regular routine and I'm going to be like glued to my lesson plan because I know that my lesson plan is important because it's like, it sets up the thing that I'm going to do in the next seven lesson plans. And you could become like really, really tied to that. And I think that there are some of us, you know, my hands up. Um, I think there are some of us who are more prone to being glued to the lesson plan than others. But I know that, I know that you know this, and this is what you're describing, Amy, that if you try to just forge ahead with the lesson plan when they're not ready it doesn't matter if you um, are willing, it doesn't matter if you're willing to acknowledge their explosion. energy or not. They have that energy. Do you know what I mean? Like they're, yeah. they're theirs, right? So you have to, like you said, meet them where they're at. And, and, and I think that's one of those games. things too, that I think as a young teacher, I was much more rigid about keeping my lesson plan. And I had to follow that. I had to get those nine songs in during that yep. class. And yep. I had to make the move and I had to make them do this. And it had to be in this order. And it had to be at this point, you know, like I, I've sort of given up on that a little bit and relaxed as I've gotten older and more experienced. Yep. And also, you know, having my own child, that certainly changed how I approach teaching children. Mm -hmm. um, and and always remembering that I teach children first, I yep. teach music second. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Amy, you mentioned bump up tomato and some people are nodding their heads like, I love that game. And some people are saying bump up tomato. What, what is that? So can you teach us bump up tomato okay. really quickly? Hilarious story about this first. So I, when I was researching for my sing a song, play a game book, or it might've been one of my clapping games book. I don't remember. Um, but I go to the place of all good things, which is YouTube. And I, I found it on uh, YouTube. So if you don't know how to play the game, you can go to YouTube. I'll teach it to you real quick in a second. But um, I found it, it, it was at an ORF level and it was being performed by a group of participants. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is this song? And then I researched, cause I am like a dog with a bone when it comes to research. And I started going down the rabbit hole. 17 emails later, I still don't know where it comes from, although I can pretty much tell you that it was composed. It is not folk, so it is not oral tradition, so it cannot be passed on in a written format because of that. So, but it it basically is you take your two hands and you put your pinky towards the floor and your thumb kind of wraps around and you're holding your fists and kind of your front of your belly button. And then I tell my kids, we're going to make a circle. So we all make a circle. And then we're holding our fists in front of us. So the top of our pointer finger is curled up toward the ceiling with our thumb wrapped around and our pinkies toward the floor and our thumbs are kind of facing each other. And then we're gonna take our left hand and we're gonna move it a little bit to the left. And we're gonna take our right hand and move it a little bit to the right. And then we're gonna take our left hand and move it a little bit more to the left. And our right hand goes on top of our neighbor's hand. 
Now, here's where we get into issues because the kids immediately are going to try to take that left hand and put it on top. And then you have the stackaroni going on. Uh -huh. And so we have to tell them, you know, don't worry about your left hand. Just worry about your right. And all we're going to do is we're just going to bump, 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 bump to the beat and keep on going. Bump, 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 bump. And then I usually have them like rub their hands together and give them a break for a second. And then I'll say, okay, try to get back there. And the purpose in that is I'm assessing if they're ready to move to the next step. I want to make sure that we can take this position without trying to stack our hands back on top of each other. So then we go back to bump, 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 bump. And they're just going to keep the beat while we sing. Bump up, tomato. I like the weather. Bring back my heart to me. And every minute, 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 my heart goes crisscross tomato sauce. Chris, cross, my heart is lost. Bump up tomato, bump up tomato, freeze. So the first time that's all we're doing, we're just keeping the beats. And then we're going to talk about the words and what are the words. And we talk about nonsense songs. And then we start adding all the different movements because there's lots of different things that go with that. So your right hand's back on top. Now I'm going to do the whole game. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through. So we do that bump up tomato, the bumping part first. Bump up tomato, I like the weather. Bring back my heart to me. Now we're going to clap four times. And every, oh, sorry, not three times. <laughs> and every, we go back to bumping. Minute, minute, minute my heart goes now you're kind of going to do a little macarena so you put your right hand on your left shoulder your left hand on your left shoulder right shoulder put your right arm straight out in front of you like the macarena with your palm down and your left hand out like that same way so it goes right shoulder left shoulder right hand out left hand out okay so now we've got bump up tomato. I like the weather. Bring back my heart to me. And every minute, 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 my heart goes crisscross tomato sauce. Now you get back to the crisscross again. Crisscross. And then you make a heart with your hands and put it over your heart. My heart is lost. And we're back to bumping. Bump up tomato, bump up tomato, freeze. And then you have one player in the middle who's wandering around and I tell them they're looking for their next victim. And their victim, and I make it very dramatic about how we're looking for a victim while we're singing the song. When the song is over, that person in the center has to go up to somebody and not get in their personal space. And I had to say just last year, don't lick anybody. Oh, we no. <laughs> I tell them you can blow in their ear gently. You cannot blow in their face, but they have to try to make them laugh. And we got to do a little countdown from 10, 9, 8. And if that person breaks any kind of a smile and giggles, they're the next person that goes in. If they don't do it in 10 seconds and make somebody laugh, they have to go find somebody else within the circle to try to make them laugh. And I always tell them, try to find the easy pickings. The ones that you know are going to crack that smile and any little crack or any little giggle and the kids who are looking at that person who's trying to make them smile has to make eye contact. That's my big rule, um, but nothing physical. They can't touch them. Um, they can tell a joke. They can make silly faces. They can do anything possible. And so we might do like, you know, five people have a turn that day and then I keep record of who's had a turn. And then the next day we might do five more. Because if you play this game 20 times in a row or 25 times in a row, it's not as much fun. You can have two people in the center and that makes it more hilarious. I've had as many as four in the middle, which gets a little chaotic, um, but it's a super fun game. And I love also that, you know, it's syncopation. Really nice syncopation it happens numerous times. So it's great that it doesn't happen in just one isolated place. Excellent. Excellent. And did we already specify that you're using this with upper elementary? Um, we did not, but I do use it with upper elementary only. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I, Great. For me, my highest grade is fourth grade. So that's my top of where I will go is, is I will use this with fourth grade. Oh, and one thing I should say too, is that um, most, of course, you know, singing games are like any other song. They can be used for multiple concepts, Ooh, right? So, and for multiple point. grade levels too. So while I might use something for speaking and singing voice, like um, we are dancing in the forest, 
I might use that one for speaking and singing voice with my younger students, but I might reintroduce it like in first grade to work on steady beat. And then we might play barred instruments on the steady beat. Whereas I might use it in second grades to do improvisation during that part where they're asking the wolf where it's going. They may have mm-hmm. to play where they where they're going. So it can be used and scaffolded and spiraled up through many grade levels, depending upon the concept that you're looking at. That's one of the beautiful things about singing games. Yeah. And so when you say, you know, I start with the concept to some people that may seem like, oh gosh, that seems kind of limited. Like, wouldn't that like cut out a whole bunch of options? And yes, it does. And that, that's a good thing because if you have too many options, uh, that is just overwhelming. But also when you're looking at a a musical focus, the good news is if we apply that curricular lens with a creative lens, all of a sudden, you don't just have to do the book as we've read it in Amy's text, right? That's not the only option for it. We can find all of these different musical pathways. Very quickly, Amy, since you mentioned We Are Dancing, can you teach us the game that you use to We Are Dancing in the Forest? Yeah, there there are several different variations and versions. And that's one of the beautiful things too, is you, you might have learned a song a different way. That doesn't mean that you learned it incorrectly. Most of our most of our song material is oral, and so it's been passed down vocally. And so people add different things, and there might be text differences, and there might be melodic differences. There might even be harmonic differences. I've seen some pieces that are in mixolydian, and some pieces that are you know minor. Um, so it it just really depends on the piece. But we are dancing in the forest is another circle dance, and they do students join hands and they're going to circle around while they're singing. We are dancing in the forest while the wolf is far away. Who knows what will happen to us if we finds us at our play? And then I usually have two wolves, and the two wolves are over in a certain designated space, and. Um, they're going to come chasing after everybody at the end. After we say, wolf, are you there? And the wolf has to answer, no, I'm doing, and usually it's something silly. No, I'm baking brownies. And then we ask again, wolf, are you there? And then they'll say, no, I'm brushing my teeth, you know, with brownies. Oh, okay. And then the third time, Wolf, are you there? Yes, and I'm coming to get you. And that's when they have to chase and they tag new people to be wolves. Those two new players go to that designated space in the classroom and the game starts over again with the circle going around and singing the song again and asking the silly questions. I love it because it's so imaginative and it's Mm -hmm. very interesting when you see those kids that are really working hard to figure out what they're going to what they're going to answer and how they're going to answer and i've had some really really interesting answers over the year you know no i'm at the zoo and i'm taking care of the cheetahs yeah okay yes i'm you know i'm in the arctic swimming with the polar bears oh great okay and you know you give a few examples so that you can let them know that there's really nothing off limits um, but it's it's really funny and it's very exciting and fun in that chasing thing, of course, you know, like, you know, depending upon your space and your situation, it might be full on running or um, for me, it's usually heel run. Mm. Um, I usually have them run on their heels um, or sometimes I will have them hop. Yep. I will say I need you to hop this time or I might say I need you to skip this time to tag a partner or I might have you say you know like you're all going to walk backwards to (laughs) tag your partner um so it depends on it it depends too on the repetition the number of repetitions the number of repetitions often means that you need to change what you're doing in terms of how you're playing that game slightly so if you're full out running the first like five times and you can start to sense there's there's a point at which they turn the children yes. turn and, um, and, and you they know. you know they start to, and then you have to change up the game or you have to say okay and we've had five turns today and we will do five more turns next time so that everybody does get a turn because the turn taking is really 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 important that everybody plays the game mm-hmm. and in order to be truly inclusive everybody does need to play the game that doesn't mean that everybody needs to do everything in the game so if you have a farmer and you have a wolf and you have a princess or whatever you have everybody might not get to do every single one of those parts um but you might like when we're playing black snake for example i will i will say you know you have you can either be the guesser 
or you can be the hider, but you're not going to get to do both jobs. You're mm -hmm. going to get to do one or the other, and you will not get to choose. Yeah. And, and that's hard. The end of the discussion, because they know like, yeah, this is how we do games. And yeah. Yeah. And they, and they also know that you mean it, right? Like I, I have given this boundary, like we will go up to this point and we're not going any further while yes. we're on this subject, Amy, uh, does everyone, so everyone will be involved in the game because that's part of participatory musicking. Is everyone going to be, uh, have a, have a turn to do something this class? Or is it going to be like, we'll revisit the song another time, like over a series of several lessons, everyone gets a turn. A lot will depend on how many parts there are for those special jobs kind of things. So for, for, you know, for the wolf game, for who's dancing in the forest, there's going to be two, right? I could make that three, right? Mm -hmm. If I had a really large class, I could make that four or five, right? If I had a very small class, I could make that one person. And that's just a way of modifying for your class and your situation. Also, your teaching situation is going to dictate what kind of turns you're having. If you see your students three times a week, oh yeah, great. If you see your students twice a month, well, you know, they may have forgotten that game by the time you get them back. So you might want to figure out how you can duplicate some of those jobs mm -hmm. so that everybody feels like they're getting a chance to be a leader of some sort. Right. So the black snake game, everybody gets to be a hider and everybody gets to be a seeker. Um, I have I have partnered children up to be the hider and two children get to decide together where to hide the snake yep. or two children are on the outside getting to be the, the seeker looking for the snake. So a lot depends on your teaching situation and the frequency and the length of your classes and all of those variables. And are, are you know, are your kids going to have a field trip the next class and you're not going to see them for two weeks or three weeks. So, you know, so much depends on where we're at in our schedule and our cycle and all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that you mentioned is um, the, like with a chasing situation, um, that this is something that, again, you can open up the book and say, uh, you know, depending on what version of Black Snake you're using, it sounds like you're using like the, um, the, the I'm loud, using quiet. the North Carolina one from the Disney <laughs> collection. Yes. <laughs> so like a, a hide and seek, um, loud and quiet version. If yeah. you have um, something that's like the, the chasing version, or you mentioned we are dancing in the forest as a chasing game. We have so many options. Like let's say that we're in a small portable and there's not room for us to all run around like we would on a playground. You're saying that we can take this book and open it up and be like, no, I'm not going to do it exactly like this or exactly like this today. Like we have all of these options. And I think that's really freeing for people, Amy, because uh, one of the main reasons when I talk to people about why they're not really into singing games, one of the main reasons is the chaos level of something like, and this is a beautiful example of something like a chasing game. So can we talk a little bit about your, um, your perception of chaos in the classroom? What's, what's enough? What's too much? And how do you decide and how do you help students kind of navigate these like really exciting moments? boundaries <laughs> and a lot of that is really personal comfort level mm -hmm. right? like some people it's okay um neurodivergent teachers that's really challenging that's really tricky and really tough so do you have half of your class playing a steady beat on a drum or do you have half of your class playing a pattern on drums or do you have like a quarter of your class playing a pattern on drums and a, the other quarter of your class playing a different pattern on shaker eggs um, so that you can play the game safely and feel more in control of the classroom and still maintain that good behavior management. Mm -hmm. um, and so much depends on, again, your teaching situation, but you never have to do something as written like anywhere, anywhere, except for maybe the Bible, but you, <laughs> you have to like, they're like in, in legal things, of course, yep. but you never have to do something exactly the way that um, something is written. I don't ever feel that anything I pick up as a teacher that is, you know, a lesson or an activity or a guide is something that I cannot personalize mm -hmm. because that that's my freedom and my autonomy as a music teacher and as a music educator, what I choose to do with my students, because I'm the expert in the room. 
And more often than not, I'm the expert in the building. Yeah. Right. So my word, my way, (laughs) and we're going to do it in the safest, most musical, most playful, most child-friendly way possible. And if that means that half of your class is doing something else, not sitting, that to Mm -hmm. me is not an option. And that's one reason I really don't like elimination games because I just feel like they teach our kids a big fat goose egg, nothing. Um, Give them a job, give them a task, give them something so that they feel like they're still a part of, not a part from. Oof, yes. Everyone has a job. Everyone is doing something. So however we are adapting these games, we are adapting them so that everybody has a a place in our ensemble, which is, I know, a a really um, important piece of our heart as we present this music to students. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, you know, as you talk about these being folk songs, um, none of these were carved in stone. Like none of them came down from on high, you know, and, and into the, the, the woods of North Carolina, you know, or wherever it's from. Like these, these adapted and these were evolved and they, they changed over time. And one day someone came along and they wrote it down in standardized Western notation. And that's one version of it. But the whole point is that these are breathable. Right. Absolutely. And I love when teachers send me or tell me like, oh, hey, I did this this way. And I'm like, oh, hey, wait a minute. Can I record you on my phone saying that? Because uh-huh. I want to do it this way and try it this way. Yeah. I think on a grizzly bear, which I, I, when I was researching this, I was blown away because I don't know if you know who Tossie Aaron is. But I do. Tossie, yeah. So Tossie was one of the grandmothers of the American Orschelberg Association. She was one of the first ones in the United States to start you know, sort of authenticating these materials and writing them down and creating books. She wrote a book called Music Book O. Um, and when I started researching that that song, because I really wanted to know a little bit more about it, because like it's so vague and it's in so many places. And when something is so vague and it's in so many places, I'm always like, there's some story. There's some story that nobody ever captured. Um, and so I called Tossie. And because I found out that it was part of a Norwegian song called Bjorn and Sover and that she had gone to Hungary and she had studied, I don't know who with, but she had found out she'd heard this song and sung this song and played this game and loved it. And she just very casually said to me on the phone, oh, you know, well, I just wrote the words for American children. She is the one who actually wrote those words. Nowhere is that credited anywhere. Um, And she passed away shortly after I spoke with her on the phone, but it was such Mm -hmm. a sweet conversation, just how, you know, humble and just so casually, like today, we're so like careful about that's my song. And, you know, Uh um, she was just like, oh, I just wanted American children to be able to sing this. And, you know, I think there's like five different versions of the game in my book about how to play the game because teachers have adapted and there's like a parachute one and yeah, you know, there's all these different ways. So there's no one way. There's no one way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Okay, Amy, as we're wrapping up here, I would love to hear any um, any final kind of words of wisdom as we go forth and play in our classrooms. And then I would also love to hear more about your books. And maybe if you were to think of, uh, we want everyone to buy all of your books. If you were to think of like a good one for people to get started, what might that be? So oh, any, any love words that of question. wisdom? All right. So first I'm going to talk about some of my favorite singing games because I actually sat here and made a list because I was oh, like- good. Oh, Go to my some of my favorites. Black Snake obviously is one of my favorites. I love it because it teaches dynamics in such an authentic way. And they really do have to work on singing fortissimo and not using their shouting voice, which is tricky for children, right? Like, but it's so fun and it's so playful. And I had this big rubber snake that I got at Dollar 25 Tree. That's what I'm renaming the store now. I'm renaming it Dollar 25 Tree. Fair. Um, <laughs> but but they love the rubber snake. And when I get the rubber snake out, yeah. Um, Agua de Limon which another one from Colombia, Zinia Maredu, which is in my book that's from South Africa and a very lovely person when I was at International Music Village in Finland taught me that and it's become one of my absolute favorites. It's like a a mystery beat game and somebody's keeping the beat, but you don't know who it is. Love it. And you have to figure it out. So fun. Who stole my chickens and my hens? One of my other favorite clapping game kind of things, Um, but it's a singing one. Um, Apple tree. 
forever and always, my children will beg for apple tree. We have added so many ostinati to <laughs> apple tree. If you don't know what an ostinati, it's a stubbornly rooting pattern that goes with a piece of music. Um, very simple explanation. Doggy, doggy. Because again, the, the low hanging fruit of having them sing a solo becomes a low hanging fruit. They don't have to think hard and work hard to be able to sing that solo. They just do it because it's fun and playful and in the moment. Round to do bop. I taught that to my first graders January, like the first week back in school in January. Every week since I'm greeting children at the door, the rest of the class is in the room. What do they start doing? Round to do bop. Together, singing the song. I'm out in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that's like that's music joy, right? Yes. Um, Cha Cha Tsubo, which is a Japanese tea one that's super fun and very challenging for upper elementary. Bamba Tomato, Soy in our Serpiente, which is a crawling on the floor in between people's legs snake game that's super fun. Um, Chickens and Foxes, which is one that I wrote to replace Chicken on a Fence Post. Grizzly bear, of course, bluebird, bluebird, so fun. Um, oh, who are you, which is also in my book, but that one's more for upper elementary just because there's a clapping and stomping pattern that is really challenging. Mm. Um, Plainsies, clapsies, son macaron, all of those kind of slap, we call them slap games. I don't kill the kids, they're slap games, but, and then Highland Gates is another one that people don't often think of as being a game, but there is a game element of it because they're kneeling down on the floor, kind of asking somebody to marry them. And one person becomes two and two becomes four and four becomes eight. And it's this really nice doubles lesson yeah. <laughs> that goes very nicely with first grade when they're talking about doubles and they just love that game. It's another one that they will just play, 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 play. So those Beautiful. are the favorites. So I, I love it. It's part of your question. <laughs> no, that's fabulous. Thank you for doing that. Of that list, could you zoom through? Maybe, maybe we'll take like the bookends. Maybe because I feel like um, for for a lot of people, you know, and, and my hand is up here. Um, maybe like first through third grade. I feel like there's a lot of room. But if you guess wrong for like very young kids, and if you guess wrong for our very old kids, that that is kind of a, a sad day. So. Could you just zoom through which of those would you say are for like our itty bittiest musicians and our biggest musicians? Well, first off, I teach four-year-olds. So that's my itty bittiest. I don't do a lot of singing games with my four-year-olds because they're just developmentally not ready for that kind of parallel play. Yep. Um, they're just figuring out how to go to the bathroom without trailing 25 feet of toilet paper. Their sequencing skills are not there yet to be able to, and the consequences part too yeah. of an elimination kind of thing, or you have to go do this, or this, this leads to no, it's, this. It's the end of very day. challenging yeah. for them. Kindergarten, I do a little bit with them. I do Zim Yama Redu with them because it's that beat discovery game. And it's again, steady beat. We never stop working on steady beat, right? I've worked with 80 year olds and I've worked with, you know, two year olds and uh -huh. <laughs> We don't ever stop working on steady beat. So um, Zinyama Radio is a really good one for working on steady beat. And that's a very easy, you know, easy game. Doggy, doggy, same kind of thing for K, late kindergarten, mm -hmm. early first grade. And then third grade, one of my, I'll tell you one of my new favorites this year. And this is from Jennifer, oh Lord, what is her name? Sing to Kids. Oh, Bailey. Bailey, thank you. Yeah. Jennifer Bailey's blog had this really cool game from from Taiwan called Paper, Scissors, and the Cloth. So it's Jen Dao Shi Tu Bu. And it's my dear friends, let's take a bow, shake our hands and play a game. Paper, scissors, and the cloth. If you win, I follow you. And does it sound very Taiwanese? No, but um, colonization. So I'm, you know, just, just that's, that's all I need to say, right? Because yeah, it doesn't have a particularly Asian kind of sound to it. And many of these songs that come from Asia and from other places as well, have either been rewritten for our ears mm -hmm. here in the United States, 
or they were as a result of European and Western European influences. So just know, but just know that's a super fun game for third graders because everybody gets to be a leader. So they pay, play rock, paper, scissors at the end of the game. If you win, I follow you. So one person is walking around the room while we're singing the song and that person faces somebody. If you win, I follow you. And then they rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Whoever wins stays in front. Whoever does not win goes to the back. So now we have two people wandering around and the same thing happens again. Or you can do it with partners and everybody's in a partner and then everybody goes behind somebody and then two become a line of four. And it, then you get to one winner and yay, and everybody cheers for the winner and woo -hoo. But that one is really fun. And that one's one I just discovered just this year. I just started using that. Um, I love anything with rock, paper, scissors. I use rock, paper, scissors in my room all the time to decide which partner is going first, who's going first to the instruments, who gets this instrument. If both, you know, I let my students self-select when we go to the ORF instruments. Um, and if they go to the bases first, you know, because everybody wants the big ones. That's right. So they run to the bases first. And if two people get there at the same time, they just like, <sighs> and they turn to each other and they just start rock paper because they know that's just how we resolve arguments because it's complete chance. Mm. So I really do. That's a really good one. For third grade, I also really like the the range on that one because it's it's a ninth mm. goes from a low C up to a high D, and that's really nice to get those singers up into that higher range of their voice and their head voice. So that's another reason that that one works really well for older kids and not necessarily for younger kids who need a more limited singing range, like Apple Tree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, any, you mentioned bump up tomato for older students, anything else from that list that you, you might say like, yeah, try this with your upper, upper students. Cha Cha Tsubo is a game where it's a teacup game that comes from Japan. And so one fist is in front of your body. And then you're either putting the other hand with your palm on top of that fist, or you're putting your palm underneath it. And then you're switching the other hand and doing the same thing. And it goes back and forth. So being top, bottom on one hand, switch hands, top, bottom, switch, top, bottom, switch, top, bottom, cha, cha, tsubo, cha, tsubo, cha, tsubo, futa, ni, and it goes on. And you're supposed to end up with your teacup with a lid on top. Cute. So, that. and then this is the dish underneath the saucer. And this is really challenging for the kids um, because they don't tend to do a lot of finger things. If you yeah. probably have noticed, if you do finger plays with your kindergartners, they're like, what is this magic? And they're like, oh my gosh, I have another hand. Like yeah. I've never used this thing. Um, so yeah, so anything we can get do to, you know, kind of increase that, that ability to use both of their hands is such a great thing, but it's just super fun. And, you know, that's a tempo game and anything with tempo, you know, that, mm -hmm. that increases is just, it's just fun. Right. And it's so fun for fourth grade. And then it's really fun to like, you know, okay, let's speed up, but then let's have a take crescendo at the end, or let's start at fortissimo and then slow down and, and get really quiet, you know, like just starting and playing with those dynamics and tempi things together. Mm -hmm boy, that's really challenging for the older kids because then they have to really start thinking, okay, I'm doing two things at once, plus I'm singing, plus there's this hand game thing. That's a lot. And again, developmentally, that's not something you would ask a kindergartner to do, right? But but adding dynamics with tempi changes, mm -hmm. that is just another layer of complexity that really blows those older kids because it really makes them work a little bit harder. They can't go on autopilot. Yes. Yeah. And it, and it's a time bound challenge, right? Because we're dealing with tempo. Like if, if you miss it, if you miss it, you have to just jump back in, you know, right. like there's, there's no time. There's no time. Yeah. Right. I love that. I love that. And also four white horses is another one. I don't consider that necessarily to be a singing game. Um, it's a fun activity and it's almost a dance. It's the same thing as, you know, like I consider a singing game to be something that has some element of play, some element of fun or some challenge to it. Four White Horses is a really lovely singing game. So is um, Draw a Bucket of Water. Like really fun dance. Some people call it a singing game. There's not a game element to it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
it's a it's a really fun routine. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. I call it a dance because it, you know, we are moving and we're moving in a choreographed sort of manner. And but it's not it's not necessarily a, a game in terms of there being some kind of aspect to it that's either competitive or playful. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Amy, as we wrap up here, which of your books would you say, in addition to all of them, which of them would be the ones that you would recommend that people listening are like, oh my gosh, I love all of this. I cannot wait. I have to know every single version of Apple Tree that she has recorded, right? Which, which uh, books would you say we should start with? Okay. So first up, I would say, uh, you know, it depends on what you're looking for. So, and I know you people hate that answer, but um, there's two hand clapping books. One is called Hands to Hands, and that's hand clapping games from around the world. The second one is Hands to Hands, that's American and Canadian ones. So if you're looking to add to your collection, get the second one. And then there's Playful Possibilities, which is children's literature with props and playful stuff. And then there is, see what came next. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Um... I think the next one was Painted Music, and that is art, children's literature, and music activities that are all integrated together. And then there's Sing a Song, Play a Game, which is the one that we've been mostly talking about tonight, which is 71 singing games from around the world. And then hopefully in May, I will be having a new book coming out called Color Me Music that's all about color. Wow. Tell me, tell me more about that one. Um, it is, it is all different activities and games and songs and things that have children's literature selections, the suggestions to use with children's lit. And it's all songs or games or speech pieces that have to do with color. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Oh man. And when do you think that one will be out? I think May. Excellent. I think we're in edits right now. So the book is all written. We're just editing, which is my least favorite part, as you probably are well aware. It takes a Having while. Your book and whew, marathon. It's, yeah, it is a marathon. <laughs> but congratulations. That is fabulous. I'm so excited to yeah. for everybody to go pick that up. I know um, I'll be I'll be the first order. That sounds very oh, exciting. You're sweet. And you can get this <laughs> ebooks, which I really love the love, love. Can I just tell you how much I love the ebooks? Yeah. Um they're, they're so great. Cause you can like, you get them, you download them like that. Mm -hmm. And then you keep them on your laptop or your iPad or wherever you're going. And then the nice thing is like, you open it up to the table of contents and you click on that song and it takes you immediately there. Um, I do really love the eBooks are so nice. And the eBooks you can only get direct from the publishers, which is, you can go to my website at beaten path publications. It's www.singsmileplay.com. Beautiful. Or you can get everything from like Parapole and GIA and West Music. They carry all of those too in print. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, Amy, um, anything that you want us to keep in mind as we move into trying some of these games? I know like a lot of us are going to be trying new things after this conversation. Um, anything that you want us to keep in mind as we are playing in our classrooms? Um, when I first start out getting ready to play a game, the number one thing I want to make sure is I have that song memorized. Yeah. Or I put it up on, on my smart board. You know, I don't, have a, I don't have a smart board. I have a white painted thing that my kids always are pushing. To, it won't turn on. I'm like, no, it's just paint. Um, I refuse to have a smart board. But um, I will put it up there just as kind of like a, a memory for me to remember how the song goes. But I'm going to make sure I really know that song. So that's first. The second thing is I kind of want to walk my space mm -hmm. and kind of envision how I'm going to teach that song and what I'm going to do, what kind of process I'm going to follow to make sure that, I, and I might put bullet points on that, on that, you know, document that I have up there. So to, just to remind myself, since it's new to me and it's the first time I've ever done it, I want to make sure that I get it the way that I want to do it. Right. And, but I also want to, you know, have grace and know that the kids might take me a slightly different direction and I can go there and it's okay. Um, but I'm going to teach them the basic game. And then if they have a suggestion, if somebody says, hey, can we try it? Like, yeah, sure. Let's try it like that. What did we think? Um, but always having grace with yourself and know, like we all know, like, so I have three, three sections of each grade level. So like, we all know that by the time you get that third grade class, you're like, darn, I wish I could have that first class back uh -huh. again. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the other part of that is, 
is take a quick moment after that third class to rewrite that slide or to grab your phone and hit your easy voice recorder or your recorder app or whatever you have for a voice app on there and be like, okay, next year we're going to do it this way and we're going to say this and this worked better. And just take a moment to kind of revisit and, and process that just really quickly. It doesn't take long to do a voice memo mm -hmm. that you can go back later and revisit and kind of reassess you know, what your teaching process was, because you probably cleaned it up a whole lot by that third time and you nailed it. And you're like, Ooh, and then, you know, we wait a year and don't do it again. And then we're like, wait, what did I do? So I find it very helpful to kind of either write myself a note, um, or to make a little voice recording really quickly. Cause it takes like 15 seconds for me to voice record something it takes me much longer to write it out. Um, but that, that is my best advice and have a little grace with yourself. It's mm -hmm. not going to go perfectly, probably that first class, but by the third class, woo we're flying, right? Yeah. And that's the, um, that's the innovation process, right? Like we're, we're in a wheel of trying things and, and next year it'll also be different, right? But we're always yeah. moving forward. It's that refining thing. You start out one way and it gets refined and it gets refined and it gets refined. Look up how gold is made. Look at the process that gold yes. has to go through to become a ring or a piece of jewelry. Um, there's a lot of processing that goes through that to get it to that point. Sugar crystals don't start out as sugar. They start out as these ugly green things. Beautiful. Right. And then they come out as something really sweet, but it has to go through that refining process. And you might be ugly sugar cane for a while. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But it's all, it's all in good time and there's a process and we're, and we're here to play, right? We're here to get yeah. better through play. That's beautiful. Amy, I want to thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolute blast. I've been looking forward to this all day long and I have had um, truly such a great time talking to you about this. So I'm excited for everyone to um, hear all of your wisdom and go buy all of your books. And thank you so much for having me. I so enjoyed our conversation.